Hello everybody and welcome to A Question of Property. I'm your host Lucia France and joining me are our usual panel of ever-ready experts here today. Uh, now we've got John Howard, property expert of over 40 years experience, author of more than three books on the subject and he is uh, joining us today to give us his expertise in the field. So welcome to you John. Uh, good morning, Lucia. Can I just, you haven't put groom on there because the groom hasn't turned up today at home. So I've, I've just mucked out five stables before I've come on air. Wow, hey, that is a busy multitasker, morning. Multitasker, <laughs> multitasker. I hope, I hope we've had a shower. <laughs> the hard life, isn't it? <laughs> good job we can't smell anything on Zoom. That's very handy. No, I've had a quick shower. I've had a quick shower. Okay, good, good. Um, we also have Stefano Lucatello, our international expert in terms of property, man of mystery, and also senior partner at Cobalt Law International Property Lawyers. So welcome have to you, Stefano. How are you morning. today? You'll have to tell me what you mean of man of mystery afterwards. <laughs> Not on well, that. that would be giving <laughs> mystery away, wouldn't it? Man of mystery. <laughs> Stefano actually accidentally sent me his dinner last night. I did. I'm oh, sorry, Paul. Yes, <laughs> everybody, you need night. to follow Stefano on his Facebook because uh, there's some incredible recipes out there. Very it looks cool. brilliant. Delicious. Thank you. And we also have Paul Mahoney, our straight-talking Aussie and the voice of reason within this panel, best-selling <laughs> author, award-winning property speaker and head of Nova Financial <laughs> Group. So welcome to you, Paul. Thank you. Great. Okay, so we're going to get started with a... Um, an overall question to all of you. Uh, what has been your maxim or motto in business? And do you have a different motto or maxim for life in general? So we'll go to John first for that one. Goodness me. Absolutely. Uh, well, God, that's a tough question this time in the morning. Um, <laughs> well, what I, would, what I would say is I've always taught my, my stepchildren um, to always treat everyone the same so whether it's the gardener who's out there somewhere at the moment doing something or whether it's lord someone up i know or whatever it doesn't matter they all get treated the same they all get spoken to the same way and when i used to take the kids to school you know we'd see harry the gardener and they'd all go good morning harry and that's how it should be and i think if you treat everyone how you want to be treated that's the best thing you can do and i've tried to do that all my life that's brilliant i love that thanks john uh stefano um, work hard and it'll sort itself out. Brilliant. Sit short and sweet. Not like me, the short key and lime sweet. pie. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like it. <laughs> Paul. Um, well, if, if we let like, to the, the current situation, um, I've always been very much of the mind that you need to spend money to make money. And, 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 have, and I'm the type of person that, that will spend more money than I need to. Um, and I think in the current situation, I've learned that sometimes you don't have to spend money to make money. Uh, you know, we've scaled back our costs substantially throughout this COVID-19 situation right. and, and actually done quite well throughout it. So, um, you know, I think that's a learning curve for, for, for me and for our business. Excellent. Well, may may I just say, I've never, I've never known him to be too generous in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> that's He's between not you two. Sorry? Sorry? He's not a Yorkshireman, is he? <laughs> well, Yorkshire stroke Italian. No, he's not. Hey, he might as well hey, be. He might as well not be. Many of us, there's not many of us around. We're a dying breed. <laughs> you certainly are. There are not many at all. Okay, let's move on to our sensible questions yeah. now, shall we? Okay. Um, okay, let's go to you, Paul, uh, for our first one. Um, this person is considering buying a flat off plan as their first buy to let. And they're asking, do you think that in the current circumstances, this is a good idea? Or would you buy a property that's already built so that they can rent it out immediately? Okay, so off plan <laughs> as a term is quite a broad term. Um, and I quite often speak with clients about where you fit on that scale. Uh, in that at one end of the scale, it's quite high risk. Uh, developers asking for large deposits with less of a track record, you know, less funding in place, um, you know, I've, I've seen some developments where developers are asking for up to eighty percent of the purchase price over the build period. Um, now that's very high risk for an investor, and you you want to avoid that sort of thing. Um, whereas at the other end of the scale, you've got much lower deposits. You know, ten percent uh, is, is the ideal scenario for deposits, uh, where your money is fully protected. In some cases, it can be higher than ten percent if there's some level of protection. 
put in place over and above that, um, where developments are progressed so far as sales and construction. Um, and in that case, it's, it's, it's much lower risk. So, you know, for example, I've, in the past six months, I've bought four properties off plan, uh, personally. Um, and I think in the right circumstances, getting the right locations at the right price, they can work really well, regardless of the economic or property situation. Um, like any, like any property investment. Um, so it just depends on the individual opportunity, I think. Okay. Um, and would you advise that that is a better thing to do now that, that like this person is asking, or would you just buy something that you can rent immediately? As, as I said, I think it depends on the opportunity. I wouldn't necessarily think it say it's better than buying a completed property right now. Right. Um, but if you're getting a better deal for buying off plan, then it could be better. Okay. Um, some people would say, well, buy a property now, get the mortgage in place, you know, get it let, um, and that might be lower risk. But if you're getting a better deal for buying off plan or if you're getting the best property in the development, for example, then of course that can be beneficial as well. Okay, great. Thank you very Lucia, much. Lucia, may I say something? Please. Perhaps Paul would like to get off the fence sometime. <laughs> Ooh. So for Ooh. me, for me, for me, the opportunities are um, for the moment. You don't have to take any risks going forward in the next six, nine months, buying in the next six, nine months. You're not going to have to take any risk, any silly risks. You don't have to buy a house with no garden because it was the only thing that was available. You know, you're going to have lots of choice. You're going to be able to find properties with discount. Yeah. And you can buy at a discount now, probably, or in the, certainly the next six, nine months, you'll be able to and get on and rent, rent it and get a, a really good yield. I don't think you need to take a risk personally on buying a property that won't be ready for two years and you're not sure what it might be worth when it's done. That would be my personal opinion. And I know Paul sees it in a much broader way than I do. Um, I'm looking more at a dealer type mentality compared to probably a long-term investment mentality. But I think, Paul, that has some merit at the moment, don't you or not? Yeah, look, I, I say, I, I agree with what you're saying in some ways, but if you're getting a better deal for buying off plan, that, that, that my, my point is, Paul, at the moment, you don't know when you're getting a better deal because you don't know what the market's going to be doing in two years' time. But also, John, you've just assumed that you're going to get some deals in a few months or, or now. The property market hasn't moved up or down since, since lockdown. No, but it's, Paul, it's going to because it's, it's, it's all linked to employment. So at the end, of, in my view, so at the end of the day, you know, if, if we're trying to educate uh, people to look at, you know, look at proper sensible deals with decent margins, then I, then I think the opportunities in the next six, nine, 12 months are, are going to be great. And I'm just concerned that, you know, if you've got a, a, a new build that's not going to be ready for a couple of years, then, you know, it's a little bit Russian roulette, isn't it, really? No? I think one thing I will say here as well is in this particular question, the person mm. is considering buying a flat off, flat off plan as their first buy to let. So, yeah, you know, maybe well, waiting. They could be waiting up to two years. They need to get on with it, don't they? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, shouldn't sh just I'll put my bit in. Um, if you were faced with that scenario where you had a fistful of dollars and you had the choice between an off plan and a ready made second hand existing property that is either ready to let or is, is already let and you should buy it, wouldn't you go for the latter as opposed to the former because you've got a straight income coming in from day one? And then so Savano, the it depends on what, what your goal is. So if, if this person being a first time investor, that they probably got you know, limited funds and they're looking to build a portfolio. Now, therefore, their, their main goal is quite likely growth in, 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 in building the portfolio. That's how you build a portfolio is through growth, not through income. Yeah, but he's not going to have any um, growth for the next two years until the property is built and he can rent it That's not true. Out. So if you reserve no. a property today, yeah. In, in a good location that's growing in value. So you reserve mm. at 200 grand today. Mm. Um, any growth in that asset value over the next two years is yours. You, you, you do achieve capital growth when you reserve off plan. Paul, Paul, when, the market, Paul when the market is going up, I don't disagree with you. It's still a little bit like Russian roulette, but you might as well give it a go if the market's going up. But in a market where we know it's, it can't possibly go up in the next two years, it cannot possibly go up in the next two years, the best we can hope for is that it stays the stays as it is. 
In which case, are you know, are you, because it's new, are you paying a premium? We're always talking about microclimates, right? So yeah, we yeah, are. Yeah, absolutely. Don't necessarily we'll disagree right about that. Talking yeah. about the yeah. overall property market. Yeah. You can't invest in the overall property market. You can only invest in specific properties in specific areas. Now, I'll give you a perfect example. I bought two properties in the past six months in a place called Digbeth in South Birmingham. South Central mm -hmm. Birmingham. It's very, very central. It's five minutes more. By the way, can I just say, I've taken your tip on there and I've, I've researched that area. Thank it's you good very area. much. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. 20 or 30 you know, get on. on the rest of the city. And yeah. they're, they're, there's literally billions of pounds being spent there. You've got Smithfield Market that's been bought by Lendlease. You've yep. got Curzon Street Station, which is the high street, so high street, uh, sorry, high speed rail. Uh, new the, the, what, the only thing that disappoints me, you've now told everyone else as well. <laughs> <laughs> well look, you know, he told everybody day, else on his Facebook science Live science. the other day. He's, he told oh, them. We'll, we'll cut this bit out, John. Don't um, worry. <laughs> I suppose what I'm getting at is when, when you have billions of pounds being yeah. spent on the underloved yeah. area of a city, um, yes. regardless of the direction of the overall market, that's going to have a positive impact. Yeah, no, I can, I can see there's exceptions to every rule, Paul. I can see that. Growing value, regardless of whether the property market goes backwards. Okay, well, I'm glad we cleared that up. Could I just actually add my two cents worth here? Because once oh. we bought an off plan property, <laughs> the build time ended up being so much longer than, you know, you can't always go, go by what they're saying the build times are going to be because it's. <coughs> It's dependent on funding and things like that as well, isn't it? But, so but that's the same, that's, Lucia, that's, the, that's the same everywhere. It's the same yeah. whether it's a UK property or a foreign property. And I would say to clients who, are buying, who want to buy off plan abroad, and it's even more Russian roulette abroad than it is here. Mm. It depends which country you're going to. But, you know, if I had if I had 100 grand in my pocket and I had a choice to invest in a ready-made property where I could stick a family in or a professional couple <clears throat> and rent it out immediately, I wouldn't be waiting two years for growth I'd be wanting rental, I'd want a rental yield, a return on my investment, because if I'm borrowing money, then how am I going to pay the, the, the loan back in the two years that, that it's still so that's, being so that's built? that's a perfect in. point, Stefano. When you buy off plan, you don't need the loan until the property's done. No, you so just you need the deposit. So if you put down a 10% deposit you need, you need to put on a 200 grand it. property, yeah. you put down 20 grand, mm. and if that property grows in value by 10%, that's a 100% return on your deposit. Yeah, yeah. Also get a, a, a you also get all the warranties. You've got a two-year builder's defect period. You've got a ten-year structural warranty. Your dishwasher, your oven, your fridge are all under warranty, um, and you get to pick and choose from what you're buying within a development. So my point is, in some cases, it can make a lot of sense if you're getting bit the right boring, deal. Though. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> Donna, I, I did a webinar on Wednesday, taste. and and somebody asked me. What is the difference between your approach and John Howard's approach? And I said, <laughs> really? <laughs> it was really. John Howard is constantly calling me boring. Um, <laughs> but um, that's yeah, probably, property probably, that's, is that's, probably worked, that's probably worked in your in your favour. <laughs> I would ignore the English market. I would just go and invest abroad. That's the best. Well, I'm glad you and said that. I know it's your solicitor, of course. Because I think you've got your next question. Yeah. I'm moving on to your next question now, thankfully. Um, thank you for everybody's different opinions there. Um, so, for Stefano, I want to buy a brand new purpose built apartment in Italy, but you oh. hear horror stories regarding this type of property in Spain and other places. Is Italy similar in that respect? This must be the same chap that went to Paul's lecture on Wednesday. <coughs> um, right, buying property abroad is no different from buying property abroad uh, in England off plan. <coughs> so buying abroad has that other dimension, which is you've got a different area, a different uh, law, different language, and the rules are totally different. There are some countries that safeguard uh, investment into a future off plan development so as to protect um, the investor. Uh, especially Spain, uh, France, uh, and in Italy, and they do it in different regards. Spain, you need a bank guarantee. Uh, France, you can't actually start selling to the public unless the builder has got to foundation stage and completed the foundation stage. And in Italy, the same as in Spain, the developer has to give a bank guarantee on each of the, of the stage payments. Right. <clears throat> this is because in the early 19, uh, 1990s and later 1990s, there was a, a 
a whole raft of Italian builders that were building, especially in the south of Italy, where the mafia is involved and the other the other mafia type uh, organizations who were taking uh, money from people and just disappearing with it. And in fact, they, what they were doing is they were marketing half developed buildings that have been left for many, many years, uh, visually altering the pictures, preparing um, brochures, <coughs> and issuing it to the public. <clears throat> and I was involved in many cases in the early 2000s in this relation and getting the money back. So the idea is that you must get a bank guarantee and the bank is a fiduciary a document. So that if the developer goes under or he fails to complete, then you can make a claim against the bank and the bank will pay you back your stage payment. Um, the problem with buying abroad off plan is that you need someone who's going to continue to look at the development and keep an eye on it who needs to be local to it and make sure that it's being done in the proper manner and that it's reaching its stage points as and when. Because there are two types, as the guys will tell you, there are two types of off plans. There's an off plan which says you pay five, four or five stage payments at set points in the building process. And then there's the other one, which I think is all, more risky, which is where every so many months the builder comes back to you and say, I want this payment, I want this payment, but it's not fixed to any market, any marker, sorry, on building. And that makes it even more difficult, and especially when you're abroad and you're not there, unless of course you live there already and it's an investment. But if you're not there, you need someone who's on the ground, someone who is an expert, an architect, a surveyor, to actually look and see that it's being done and to play your game for you in your absence, i.e. shout when it's not being done or if it's being done wrong or whatever. So you need to have someone on the ground. You need to make sure that the development contract um, is sound. And, and you mentioned, Lucia, about um, uh, delays. Yes. It's very common everywhere, whether it's England or abroad. But yeah. the builder, for one reason or another, either can't get the market, uh, can't get the materials, he can't yeah. do the job or whatever, Definitely. and he has to extend. Definitely. Yes, can you have a, a backstop where you can get your money back should it not yes. be ready by that time? Absolutely. Absolutely. What happens in most contracts like here is that there's, force, there's a force majeure clause um, right. and at abroad in civil law jurisdictions, force majeure is, 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 is part of their civil law code. In England, as you both know, force majeure doesn't act unless you actually put a force majeure clause in. And then there's a whole series of other hoops you have to jump through. Uh, like we're doing at the moment now for some clients who are saying, well, COVID-19 stopping us from doing whatever we need to do or yeah. whatever. Mm. And other people say, well, no, I think you can do it, even though we've got COVID-19. So, yes, the foreign contract must be drafted properly. And that's where we come in. I mean, you know, I always say to clients, what is the point of being able to buy something off plan if that is built, but the rest of the development isn't built? So because Good point. People, yeah, that's true. It, 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 that is never covered, John. It's never covered by a yeah. contract. I've never seen a contract done by a developer abroad where he says, I will build you flat number whatever, mm. and I also commit to finishing the rest of the development, which is the swimming pool. The within, within a time period. Mm. Yeah. Within a time period. Well, he doesn't mention them at all. I've never seen that. Yeah. And when I go in and I say, right, hold on a minute, I want a commitment from you, Mr. Builder. Yeah. You will honour the rest of the development. Yeah. He, he tells me to go away. So, mm. you know, that's very difficult. You've got to be very careful to see. It's not a question of, of just, you know, paying your stage payments and knowing you're going to get them back. It, you need to know when it's going to be finished, how long it's going to take, and what are your, re, uh, your, um, your uh, what's the word, what's, what's your rescue plan if the guy doesn't do it within a certain time? Can you pull out? Always have an out before you have an in. I would say to clients, always look at your exit strategy before yeah. you, you go into it. It's, it's important. Very Absolutely. And I think um, there, Stefano, would you say that Italy is uh, just as risky as Spain or, or less risky? No, it's, it, it's, it's no, it goes back to what I always say. If it, buying property abroad is no more difficult than buying property through John or Paul or whatever in England, whatever. It's who is behind it helping you. If you've mm. got an expert, you know, I don't profess to be an English property, although I used to do conveyance many years ago. I don't profess to be an expert like the other two guys in their field, but I am an expert in my field. So I would say I can look after you in the countries that we deal with, which is Italy, France, Spain, Portugal, Turkey, whatever. And I know that we can guarantee that we'll look after you in a proper manner so that your contract will reflect what it should do to protect you in various circumstances. And, and, and Lucia, can I just say this, this goes, as always, mm -hmm. surround yourself with the best possible advice you can get mm -hmm. and pay for it. And the difference between paying for, paying for someone who's all average and paying someone who's very good is not a great deal. The difference you get in service is massive. So as always, surround yourself with the best possible advisors. Okay. And, and the final point, Lucia, just the final point, it's, it's the case that if you don't surround yourself with, with an expert uh, team and you try and do it yourself 
or you leave it in the hands of someone that you you're not sure of yeah. then you will it'll cost you a lot more to come backwards and have it put right than it would if you pay well in the beginning okay thank you very much i suppose as well just one question that i had that <coughs> came into my head there is i suppose you've got to look at things like location and everything as well in terms of these things because if it's up on a mountainside somewhere and you know that the golf course never gets finished or things like that then that can be completely different to being just on the edge of a town or a beach or whatever well it depends what you're buying it for you know yeah. most people most people have an agenda it's either to move out there permanently lifestyle change it's either as an investment or it's a bit of both if it's an investment and your asset has to work and these two guys are the experts on making assets work and you want it to work and you want to return an investment irrespective of growth but you want to return an investment you've got to make sure that it's in the right location it's in the right place it's got all the amenities it'll do what it says on the side of the packet otherwise you will you know if you if you're uh, um, if you're directing yourself to families with kids and there's no swimming pool you're not going to get a tenant are you you're not going to get someone yeah. going out there yeah. Yeah. right and just a slight you. addition to that we, we get asked all the time about buying overseas and something that you need to be very aware of when you're buying in a foreign country is foreign exchange yeah. because Good as soon point. as you invest in a different country with a different currency if that currency moves against you that can completely wipe out your returns yeah yeah absolutely um you know, perfect example is if you go back 10 years ago um the australian dollar was quite strong 10 years ago and lots of chinese buyers bought in australia they yeah. bought well they probably did quite well but the australian dollar has tanked since then uh, which has wiped out all of their returns. Yeah. Um, so you need to be aware of that as well. Yeah. Yeah. I've got a, I've got a client at the moment who's buying in Nice, and he's put everything on hold irrespective of COVID because for that reason, Paul, that the, you know the euro to the pound, it's it's gone absolutely ballistic. So he's not getting the same. He's not having no. to put in the same amount of money as he had done calculated five months ago. Thank you very much, guys. Okay, that's a really comprehensive answer to that question there. Okay, so moving on to John's first question for today. Yes. Um, I understand a number of property educators are pushing HMOs models, uh, so houses of multiple occupation, as a safer yeah. option going forward post COVID 19. Yeah. Personally, I'd like to hear what John thinks of this strategy. I think this person knows me quite well because they know what I think of HMOs. <laughs> so HMOs, okay, well, they used to be called, as I always say, my day, they were called my day, bedsits uh, years ago when I used to do them. Um, and uh, it's, back you know, John there's nothing. Young. In, back when John was young. You know, someone said to me uh, two days ago, they said, oh, um, now you've retired, what do you, th I said, hang on a minute, I haven't retired, I'm as busy as ever. Anyway. Um, 40 years so, experience, but you obviously exactly, started very yeah, young. Absolutely. So, so the thing, what they're, what they're saying is, because going forward is uncertainty, so because of that, what you want is rental income, and the best way to get rental income is HMOs. Now, I sort of agree with that in a way, but what their argument is, is if someone's in a two-bedroom flat, they're going to end up in an HMO because they won't be able to afford the rent, so they go from you know two bed, one bed, down to an HMO. My argument is if you're in a two bedroom flat and you're struggling with the rent, presumably you'll just get a mate in, someone who, who's also in the same position as you, to rent to, to share the rent on the two bedroom flat. Right. Or if it's a one bedroom flat, it might be slightly different, but you're more likely to go home, these young people are, hmm. and save all the money, then they are going into, if they can, and some can't, I accept that, than going into an HMO, because actually HMOs aren't particularly cheap. You know, they're probably three, four hundred pound you know, a month. Well, if you've got a, a two bedroom flat at 650, plus bills and everything else, except I accept that, then if you get someone else in to help you pay it, you're better off than being in a bed sit or HMO. So that's my argument. So I, I don't, I don't, I don't see in certain situations, I'm sure they're probably right, but not every situation. I think to buy an HMO on the back of the fact that, oh, everyone's going to you know, move in because they can't afford the two-bedroom flat is a bit of a dangerous strategy. If you're doing HMOs, great. You know, but I wouldn't suddenly go to start doing HMOs just because of that strategy, because I just don't think when you work it through, it, it really... And also, there's a glut of HMOs as well, don't forget. But don't so, you think you know, that um, post-COVID, everyone's going to want to be really close to each other? 
because well that's the other thing why would you want to move into an hmo exactly if they were really really cheap that's different but they're not particularly cheap these hmos and some of them are very nice and they tell me these guys do a great job of them a great job of them i'm not saying they don't but like i said there's a few options like moving home which is very cheap much cheaper yeah. and much nicer probably than going into and and i accept and not not everyone can but as I said, if you've got a ha and if you've got a three-bedroom house you're renting, goodness me, you can sublet two rooms out, and you're better off. Probably you make a profit. Yeah, that's called yeah. rent to the, rent, the thing, isn't it? Apparently now. The thing that concerns me about like these that. buzzwords, and given this person ha has mentioned your know, property educators, yeah, you know, these buzzwords yeah. around HMOs, rent yeah. to rent, lease yeah. options, you know, all of the fancy stuff when it comes to property. Um, it's very easily sold. You know, when you write the numbers up on a whiteboard and say, look, I'll charge you five grand to teach you how to do this. Um, you know, it kind of makes sense when you say it like that. But, but in reality, you know, pro that's not really what property investment's about. It's a mid to long-term investment. It, it's, it's not about making quick money. It's not about making money from nothing. Uh, and, you know, something that, I'm, you know, that I always say to people is, you, you can't invest, you can't start out in property with no money. And we get asked this question all the time. You know, how do I start out? I don't have a deposit. Um, you know, can I raise money from angel investors? Well, no, you can't. Because angel investors aren't going to give you money if you have no experience or track record of making money from property. You need to save your own little pot to get started. And anybody who tells you that you don't need a deposit or you can use somebody else's money to get started in property, in my view, is being a bit disingenuous. This right. is the isn't this isn't this the topic for another question, Lucia? Yes, well, it's kind of bringing oh, us it? nicely on to this question. We've got six minutes to go, but um, we wanted to um, we wanted to sort of put this question out to everybody um, that someone's asked. I've seen a lot of these property seminars and courses cropping up. Do you recommend that I take some money and um, do a course that might help me? Which ones would you recommend? Hmm. So well, uh, well look, it's very easy to toot our own <laughs> horn here, I think. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah. But look, John and I do a course called Property Summits that, that, that is very cost effective. You know, it, we did one for free last week via webinar. The previous one, I think, was 150 quid. Yeah, this isn't a lot of money for a whole day course where you will learn quite a lot. Um, I don't believe that any person starting out in property should go and spend five to 10 grand, which is probably a big chunk of the money they actually have to get started in property to, to learn how to invest in property. Property isn't rocket science. Um, you know, you can engage with quite a lot of people and get free advice even uh, and guidance to, to get started in the right way. Um, but, I, but I do think that some of the, you know, some of the courses and property educators and things out there are very much about filling their own coffers than they are about providing value. Would I you think guys what I, what I, yeah, what I would say, what I would say is that I think you need to look at the person who's taking the course. You know, what experience have they got? Have they got a track record? A lot of these guys and girls are very good presenters. They're really good at what they do but they're not property people. They could be selling diamonds, how to buy and sell diamonds. They could be selling how to buy and sell on the stock market. They're very clever presenters and they wind the situation up and so on. And I got into this really because I wrote a book because I didn't like the advice people were getting. Um, and, um, you know, I do, do, I, do seven, I do some seminars that are relatively sensibly priced. Um, and I don't, I wouldn't say, someone said to me, well, you don't really, teach anything john you you explain what you've done and the mistakes you've made and how to avoid those mistakes which is slightly different than sitting down with a which i do to be fair but it's different it's a grown-up grown-up advice i think i would say and it's different than sitting there and saying what you know tick in a box do you know what a semi detached house is do you know what a ground floor flat is explain what leasehold is and they have to fill in fill in all these boxes and forms i mean it's like teaching like paul said it, it's like um it's like uh, treating uh, um adults like children you know most yeah. of the people who who i who attract uh, get attracted to me are people who got a little bit of money maybe already doing it and want to do more want to push on and want to be challenged and i think um hopefully that's what i tend to do and the other thing of course if it's not your main income, 
and and you pulled out you know paul 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 and i both do some well and promise profits property summits and things like that and it's not our main income it's it's i wouldn't say it's fun but it is fun but it's we want to get paid for what we do but we're not looking to make fortunes out of it because we've got our own businesses and that's the other thing that you know if, if that's the only thing they do then obviously these people are going to be much much sort of uh they try more ambitious about how they go about it and how ruthless they are compared to people who are doing it because you know it's nice to do and, and, and we're passing on information and we want to get paid for what we do but we're not looking to 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 that's the oh it's not the only income we have and i think that's quite important as well but isn't it i mean guys there's people like martin roberts who's, who's a friend of mine known him donkey's years worked with him on many tv shows and all the rest of it but isn't it the case that all these people make it look much more simple than it is? Well, I mean, and they, I'm, yeah, and they yeah. sort of they say that you, they're almost saying out there you don't need lots of money to do it. Well, I well I well I think I've the two just got a I couple of minutes left just as yeah, a reminder. Just so. very briefly, that briefly yeah. the one the two I would say is that is is that absolutely and not everyone they make out everyone can do it. Not everyone can do it, and people need to be more honest about that. Yeah. Uh, and, and look, I, I completely agree with you, John, so there, what you said there about these people could be selling anything, and that's completely right. You know, I've been to some of these courses where, you know, they're trying to create a rush to the back of the room to sign up to their 10 grand course. Amazing. Yeah. thing you want to yeah. avoid. Yeah. yeah. You know, because they could be selling anything. Um, yeah. And the crazy thing is that people do rush to the back of the room to sign up to Why their not? 10 grand Incredible. course. Yeah. I guess 9,997 well, pounds. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> Just quickly. It's usually nine thousand nine hundred and ninety-seven pounds <laughs> to sell something. You always have to end it in a ninety-seven. Is that right? Okay, <laughs> okay, good to know. Listen, guys, we're going to have to wrap it up there for today. Thank you very much for all of your input today. And um, if you do have any questions, please do email us. Ask ask at a question of My name is Lucia France. Thank you very much for watching, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>